And now, coming to you from the Pensado Media Center, powered by Westlake Pro. Hey guys, we'll get to the Michael Elizondo show in just a second, our last show from NAM. As you know, last week Maurice White died. And what does that have to do with Pensado's place? Um, when the idea hit me, I was a partner with Maurice White at Columbia Entertainment. Um, I got a chance to do amazing things with Maurice, with Maurice, from learning to watching his genius, being in the boardroom, uh, being in the studio, being in the rehearsal room, being on Broadway. Um, he vested and invested. Uh, I learned about spirituality and how to have a heart, but also how to be a lion. If you watched him on stage, he was like a panther. He just moves slowly, always stalking you, always always getting you from a performance standpoint. His stagecraft and the band's stagecraft were off the hook. Um, Maurice liked a good groove. He was a groove master, but his music was joyful. Truly, truly amazing. And oftentimes you don't have control over the universe, which he taught us. I'd left the company because of the success of Pensado's Place, thank you. Hadn't seen him for three years, always kept up about his health and so on and so forth. And two weeks ago, literally two weeks ago, I was at a memorial of all things and people said, Reese is coming, Reese is coming. And he came. And we all got a chance to see him. He was in great spirits. He was happy. We all got to say private conversations and we made a lot of promises to each other and kissed each other and said, I love you and so on and so forth. We didn't know we were saying goodbye. And knowing Maurice, he may have known. He may have just been saying, I'm about to check out. It's good. Um, the end came in a very interesting way. He uh, apparently in a classic Maurice White way, just like a song, like one of his songs. He talked to his family at night, went to sleep, said, I'm out of here and left. Perfect coda, mic drop. Um, Reese, we love you. Um, you affected us all in very dramatic ways. Um, know that you left it in good hands. Damien's got the band. I'm going to take care of Cabron. Your, your affair is in great shape. You were just left us and touched us with such incredible genius. I am so incredibly lucky and indebted to you. So I just want to say, Reese, sleep. It's going to be good. And guys, the Michael Elizondo Show. Please enjoy and thank you. Hello. Hey, everybody. How are you? Good. That was very tepid and weak, so we're going <laughs> to do it again. Hey, everybody. How are you? Very good. That's better. We always have to do our little calisthenics and warm up and stuff. So we got a couple things to do for you. Are you ready? Energy, energy. You're at the place. Pensado's place. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our winter home. It is our house, and it's really the Avid House. And speaking of the Avid House, what we believe at Pensado, as you can tell from how we talk about Chongor and how we talk about Will Thompson and all of our guests, um, we believe that you give credit to the people who do the work. So for two seconds, can I have the Avid ladies and Anthony Gordon and stuff come up here really quickly? Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's television, because you deserve a round of applause. There's Anthony Gordon. Here comes some other really gorgeous stuff. Then stuff. Well, I, there's a better name than gorgeous stuff. So I put, come on up. Absolutely. Anybody else on the side? All right. All the black women have not moved. All right, black women. Come on. Black dudes calling. Come on. Audio lives matter. <laughs> so um, every year putting this on is more than a notion. We start this about the top of December, Anthony calls me really stressed out and <laughs> says, man, we got to book stars, we got to do this. And we all get together as a family and they put up money and they do all this kind of stuff to make sure you guys can have this for free. They're a company that bet on us early. If you enjoyed our show, these people and their bosses and that company are a lot of the reason Pensado's Place is here. So for Dave and I, do me a favor, give a round of applause to Avid and the Avid Babes. <laughs> Thank you. We love you. Love you, love you. Now you may go back. <laughs> Herb, also, um, man, the sound system this year is in f incredible. I'm trying not to cuss anymore, so you guys help me. Uh, all the guys from the tech department, the sound system, thank you so much. They really care. They really help us also. Well, Dave makes a great point. We created a show out of people who usually don't get attention, and now they get a lot of attention. So Jeff back there with the beard. Jeff. Matt. 
uh, man. my man here, all these guys who are not taking any credit, give them a round of applause too. They are the shit. Excuse my French. Absolutely, homeboy. Um, we are happy to be here. We're going to get to it really quickly. A couple of things. Uh, one, we're going to have some Pro Tools for a uh, Pro Tools 12. I almost turned back Four. the clock. <laughs> That's where you wind it up. It's just, so Pro Tools 12, we have stuff to give away. Wind it up. Dave and I are lucky enough in our sort of Machiavellian way of thinking of trying to do things that we at least think are innovative. So we recently, if you pick up Mix Magazine, and you're going to hear a lot about this more, we just created the Pensado Media Center with one of our partners, Westlake Pro, and it's got an audio art gallery and a library and stuff, and we can shoot television and lines. Anyways, we shoot in L.A. If anybody wants to come to a taping of the show, these are magic little passes. They're very sexy things. If you sign them, if we sign them, you can sell them on eBay and lie to us and act like you come and go make yourself some money. So we're here to bring value to our audience. If you come up afterwards and want to take a picture of Flick, because Dave and I would like to thank you for your support and feel like coming to a show, they'll be here. Chongor will make sure that, oh, that's good. Man. <laughs> here. Scott. <laughs> wow, Herb. A curveball. Well, I'm Canadian, man. Come on, man. Absolutely. Cool, cool. But let's get to the beast that he is and bring him out. I'm assuming he's in the back. So, um, God, what can you say about this guy? Producer, musician, songwriter, label executive can go from writing with 50 Cent's to producing with Dre, to producing Carrie Underwood, to working with Maroon 5. He is an A&R executive. He is a champion cyclist. Most importantly, and this is the message for all you guys, he is a great guy. And a lot of his career is because he's been a great guy. Mm. He is a brother to us, a friend of the family. He is also Chris Lord Algie's studio mate. This guy is an absolute beast. Put your hands together. And if you're a bass player, this is Nirvana for the one and only Mike Elizondo. Hi. <laughs> I love the champion. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> What's up, Dave? How you doing? How's it going, everyone? So very early on when we started the show, what made the show elevate was Dave's Rolodex was so good that we got really good people on, and we were just prayerful. Mike very early on came on yeah. and, and gave us love, right? Mike that and I go, go farther back than either one of us wants to admit. <laughs> How's Kevin Dukes? He's doing really well. Oh, boy, I appreciate you bringing him up. No sure. question. No question. <laughs> Vince Daniels. So here you are. You have 100 different hats, hmm. right? Amazing. Does, is that part of what keeps your creative stimulus going, that you have so many different pools to play from, so many tools in your... I think it, it comes down to just my curiosity. Yeah. I'm just super curious about things and always have been, even as a bass player, trying to figure out pedals and amps and combinations. And then as I got into keyboards, the same thing. And then obviously programming and software. I was just always super curious and, yeah. and, uh, and continue to be. I'm, I think it's just how I'm wired. So when someone kind of brought up the opportunity to work at a record label. There's a little bit of hesitancy at first, sure. but I think after a while, I'm like, okay, I got to at least see what's, what's behind that door right. and see how I can learn as well as maybe make an impact on, on some artists' lives and, and their careers. And it's worked out. It's been five years now that I've, I've taken that job at Warner Brothers and, and I'm fortunate to have some success there. A little known fact, if you were around on Thursday, we had Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park, <laughs> and, and he literally, as he's closing, he says, tell Mike, remind Mike, that for a minute, Mike was the bass player in Lincoln Park, <laughs> and he had to choose between being the bass player in Lincoln Park and maybe going to work with some white kid in Detroit named after a candy um, <laughs> M&M or something. It was amazing, yeah. And, and the guys in Lincoln Park said, you need Dre. to go work right? with M&M. So, yeah, it um, was just one of those things where, you know, you, you have this sort of impasse and you have no idea what's going what's to happen. I know the first M&M record did really well. I think no one expected it to do what it, the second record to do, as hu you know, be as huge as it, it ended up being. Um, but there was just something telling me I had to see that through. Obviously, being a part of Dr. Dre's crew at Aftermath was amazing. And, uh, but to meet Mike at that time, right as they were called Hybrid Theory at the time. Yeah. And uh, Mike came over to my house and played me some demos. I'm like, oh, this was like my dream band. This right. was exactly the band I would have loved to have been in. But, you know, it is what it is. And obviously, they've done amazing. And, 
and, uh, and, and you've and done okay. I think I, yeah, I, think <laughs> I made, I made a, a good choice at the time. Go ahead. Mike, uh, now that you've gone thoroughly over to the dark side, um, <laughs> what... <laughs> Is that a racial I know, thing? I know. Or, no. Right. Okay, yeah. cool, cool, cool. It could be. <laughs> it could be. Uh, let me tell you something. There's no better musician on earth. His dad's an amazing musician, and uh, so I got to tease him, you know. But um, you and I, prior to that, go back to before you were an executive, senior vice president, I might add, um, there were some hazy things that we all thought about the record industry, how yeah. it worked, and all that. What, what, what were some of the more surprising things that you found out once you got on the inside, and how can you share something with us to help us get access to the pie that is a major label? Yeah, I mean, for me, taking the job at the major label was shocking just because I was, for the first time, I think in a long time, around a lot of people who are very talented in certain areas, and we need people who understand radio promotion and marketing. But I'm used to being around musicians, and engineers and artists. And for the first time, there's this building full of lawyers and people from different marketing backgrounds. And, and it was just a bit of a culture shock at first. Um, I'm fortunate. I work at Warner Brothers because I feel like Warner's is, uh, is extremely artist friendly. Yep. Um, and, and, and being a part of that A&R staff, there's just a wide diversity. Um, there's myself, who has more of a musician, songwriter, producer background. There's other guys who you know, don't have that background but have great ears. And, you know, it, I think that's kind of the fun of it is just we all come from different backgrounds. We hear things differently. And we're, you know, the hope is that for the artists that we're working with, that we're attentive and supportive and nurturing. And that's kind of what I try and do. I, as a producer, have worked with a, a variety of different A&R guys. And I kind of, there were some great ones and there were some not so great ones. And I tried to just figure out, okay, what A&R meant to me mm -hmm. and not really be swayed by what, the industry is right now. It, I, I think a lot of it is a bit more of an old school approach yep. in terms of artist development. And most of the things I sign are pretty early and I'll work on them for about a year before I even make the really? record. Really? Um, Echo Smith was a band that, the first band that oh, I wow. signed. Wow. And that was about a year long development process. That's an old school. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, and I just enjoyed that. And they're young, you know, and so they were, they were willing to put in that time. And, uh, and, it, and it paid off. I mean, they had a, a you know, successful first run and successful singles. By the time, sorry, Herb. Oh, go ahead. By the time a project gets signed that you bring in the label, how many people have to sign, on, sign off on it? Okay, so. Three to ten? There's, a, there's there? definitely three people. There's two people creatively. And then there's obviously the business affairs, the guys who, who are there crunching the numbers and make sure the actual thing is, you know, makes the sense. deal is, makes sense. Yep. And, and, and from your chair, give us some inside info, because we got, how many people here would like to have a record deal? <laughs> from, <Exactly>. Five. What, <laughs> what, what, mistake, Five. what mistake do you see in terms of submissions for songs to, to mm -hmm. be recorded and for, for artists getting signed? What just irritates you? What are, what are we doing wrong? What can we do to enhance the odds that we can get to a guy like you? Yeah. Um, as far as what you're doing wrong, I don't know. I mean, there's so many, there's so many ways that it, a, a lot of it is just meeting somebody. A lot of times if I get things that are just strictly emailed, it's hard to like to have time to go through that. So, I mean, obviously being at a place where you can, you know, if you're friends with someone else that I know, and, and they kind of come recommended. So, uh, you know, it, it, it really is, you know, just knowing enough people that sort of make the introductions is really the only way that I've had that, that success. But I think in terms of the, the types of songs that are being written, I think a lot of people, it's a, it's a tricky game because you gotta, you gotta sound enough like what's on the radio, but different enough that it stands out. Exactly. Do you accept tracks or complete songs? Um, you know what? I actually, I have my, my email at Warner Brothers. I accept anything. And I also have a guy that helps me listen and weed through, sort through. Absolutely. Uh, just because I just want to make sure everyone gets a shot and I can't always listen to everything. But a lot of times it's just being unique, being honest with who you are. And sometimes it might take, you know, sometimes I'm, it, people might not be caught up to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and all it takes is one artist or one song to kind of like blow the doors open. So, so manager lesson that you take with you. It's not that it's an insider's game. 
It's that you have to learn how to network. Hmm. Networking is a key component in your holster of tricks. And there's an art to it. And those that get through, it's not that you've got a barricade to what you do, is you have to learn how to meet people, like when you see them at a live event at the Avid booth, booth 6400, then you have to make an impression and create a relationship and move forward, and that allows you then to be perceived. You also have to bring fire. Bring fire. Be, be really honest with yourself. Have other, do not play your demos for your family because your family's going to say, you're the most brilliant thing since Dave Mustaine. Oh, my God, it's just <laughs> amazing. Go to your enemies. Go to people who are objective and have them really evaluate your stuff because this is what I used to tell my staff. Yeah. There's no debate about a hit record. You're right. There's you're a right. debate about a record that's not a hit, but a, a record that blows you away. It's funny, just as we've been playing my house, so Chongo and I will figure out these loops and reels to play for you guys. So sometimes I stand in the back to all you guys come because I don't want to be in the way. And all the security guards are doing this. So my, <laughs> they're just jamming, right? You don't think they'd love music because the record's a smash. Right. And, and so you have to learn that arbitration process internally so that when it comes to Mike, then he goes, oh, man, let me call you and so on and so forth. So learn networking. Yeah. I now return you back to your regular scheduled program. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Well said. Mike, Definitely. Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I was, uh, we've been friend for, friends for 20 years, and I was, I was looking back on, on some of the amazing songs that you've done, and, and, I, and I started thinking about there's a, they all have great melodies. They all have something inventive. They all have like infectious grooves. Mm. And then I started thinking, how does he work in so many genres? And not just work, but have massive records in each genre. It's because you're not selling genre, and I can't say that word. Mm -hmm. You're selling what we all care about it. And, and, and that had to be a function of your background, your dad, yeah. all the music. You I think a lot of it was, yeah, the music I grew up listening to, Motown, the Beatles. You know, a lot of rock music like, the, like Zeppelin and Hendrix. Um, and I, I think it's just, yeah, you just sort of take all of that and it kind of gets stored in there somewhere. But even working with someone like Carrie Underwood, I mean, there were, you know, it, it, for me, I was, I was really nervous at first because I had never done anything in country. Sure. But the, the coolest thing is that as soon as I met her, she put me at ease by saying, don't try and be a country writer. Just do what, do you, what do. you do. And we'll figure out a way to make it work. And Keith Urban was the same way, where he's like, don't worry about trying to figure out a country riff or whatever. We'll, you know, he'll bring that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I just try and be honest with what I like and you know, voice my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's something, it's a collaboration. So if someone's singing something that I think could be improved, or if I have an idea, you know, just dare to suck, you know, I think is the yeah. idea. You just got to like throw yourself out there and, and, and know that the best idea is going to win and no one's there to judge. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I get put in those situations where most of those people are there to just, you know, have me contribute uh, what my instincts are and, not, and don't force me to be anything else. There's, a certain, there's a certain power without boundaries, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I think you said that, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I, there, was a, there was an amazing little chunk of time where I was able to, I made a, a record with Gary Clark Jr. and then uh, Mastodon and then Regina Spector. Wow. And it, it, didn't, fa it didn't phase me until after it was all done. I'm like, that's pretty cool, you yeah, know? I'm, I'm blessed that I get that opportunity and, and people are open enough. They're not judging me because I did this. That must mean I can't do this. Um, and, uh, you know, it started, that would, interest started uh, as a bass player first, wanting to be authentic in what I play and how I played. And that sort of just transformed, you know, morphed into my writing and my production career and but just been with me. Let's talk about a creative home because all the guys either are recording at home or get to work in studios or whatever, everything, everybody's thing is different. You share a studio with CLA, correct? Yeah. yeah. And it's actually a really interesting history to the studio because it used to be where Death Row was. It was, yeah, it was amazing. In the uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, it, was, uh, it was the place where Jackson, the Jackson 5s made their victory album. That's right. Um, tons of guys would mix there. Brendan O'Brien yep. mixed uh, the Versus Pearl Jam album and STP's album. You know, a bunch of cool music made in those rooms. But then, yeah, in the 90s, it became the Death Row Records home. In there, Herb Trawick did a bunch of records, none of yeah. which became hits, but keep going. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it was cool, even watching the Straight Outta Compton movie. They didn't film it there, but they came and took a lot of 
pictures and oh, sort of they? do the layout. Oh, and cool. uh, the, the scene where Dre goes in there to work with Tupac is the actual room where I'm at now. Oh, it is. So, oh, oh cool. uh, wow. Yeah, so that was pretty cool to Forgot see the movie and that. see that. But yeah, so CLA has, it's, it, it's sort of like a, a mirror of, of itself and we sort of backed up. So he's got his own entry yep. and then there's a little hallway and then I've got my own entry and it's, it's cool. And I've act, he actually mixed the, the Cool Kids uh, single for cool. Echo Smith. So that was easy to walk the hard drive back Ooh. to him and check in on the mix. And, you know, he's a great guy to have uh, as a neighbor. Well, I was going to say, um, actually, we'll do a show from there. You can't, in CLA's room, it is just a museum oh, of, of cool it's stuff. Here's a set list from U2's gig at the, you know, at some stadium. Here's yeah. Steven Tyler's picture with this here's Mick Jagger's fingernails like and he has kept <laughs> it, he has kept everything magazines yeah. books libraries yeah. pictures it's fun so we'll, we'll do a show from there that'd but, be amazing well one of the things that, you know we're, we're in the process now of if you watch our show you'll see a credit from the fab factory which is going to be Dave's new room in conjunction with some some dear sponsor friends of ours, and it's the home. Than, it's not just a room. What's that? It's not just a room. It's it would, a moment in time. It is, it's a destination. Yeah, a moment in time. It's the nucleus of all audio. <laughs> Bail me out of this. Okay, I, I started am. something I couldn't I, finish. Right, I'm going to go back. <laughs> Got you, handing it over. Where you work and where you record and that comfort factor. Yeah. Critical, and I also believe it doesn't have to be the biggest studio. No. It can be your bedroom, absolutely. But right, but yeah. isn't it important to have an environment where you can do your thing? Yeah, I, I still feel like my studio now, even though it's a professional studio and and all that good stuff. I mean, I still feel like it's. I tried to make it as intimate as what what I felt like when I was in my bedroom doing some of my first songwriting sessions back in the early days. It, it, it's it's to me that's the, the the first impression, especially if I'm working with an artist. As a writer, as a producer, you know, the first, the moment they walk in, they just, you, you want them to feel comfortable, you want them to feel creative, and, uh, and, and you want to have things run smoothly, yeah. you know, so, uh, you know, that's pretty much how I have it set up in the control room, which is where I do most of my writing sessions, but I also have a live room, whereas if someone decides, hey, let's throw some live drums on there, that's ready to go. I mean, yeah. things are pretty much, you know, set up and ready to, ready to roll as quickly as we need them like without it like, okay, we've got this idea, now we've got to take two hours to set up to, right. to, uh, to make it come, come through. So you're one of these guys, they submit a song to you, you like the song, they work in their home studio, you want them to cut it. Do they have to change where they do what they do to satisfy no. what you need to do? Not at all. I actually made a record. You have no barrier. Yeah, I made a record with a band called Faces. Um, they're, it's a new artist that I signed to Warner Brothers. And one of the main guys of the band, uh, his name's Alex Greenwald. He used to be the lead singer for Phantom Planet. Um, extremely talented guy. Unbelievably talented. And he, I remember starting to hear the demos at first. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is amazing. What did you use? I did, he did everything in GarageBand. Really? Everything. And actually, the record, oh, cool I would that. say, is a, at least six, some of the songs, 60 to 75% original stuff that he did in GarageBand that we just transferred over, kept, maybe tweaked a little bit. But, you know, it was, if, it, if it's great, it's great. It doesn't matter how it was recorded and, and as long as it translates and, you know. So, so let's put that together. A senior vice president from Warner Brothers mm -hmm. said that while you're playing Call of Duty... <laughs> and then you put something else in your Xbox or your Sony thing, and it's Garage Band yeah. that you can turn that into a career and have a hit record. Garage Band. It ain't a really that good program. deep. <laughs> really it's good about program. what you got in here. It's not about the. It's not about the. Tools, it's so true. Right? And his original goal was to use nothing but free software. Um, He's like, I'm, I'm going to see how far I can push it. Just for the almost as like as an inspiration for that very reason to like know, hey. You don't have to spend a ton of money. Right. It really does, as, uh, as long as you have it here and here, and you, you've got the creativity and the imagination, you, you know, you make it happen. And, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. My, Mike, um, I want to read this, because this is pretty disturbing. Uh -oh. I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> I want you guys to help me. Guitar players, I want you to be very vocal. Mike said, and I quote, bass players, bass players don't do shit. <laughs> Bass players are able to hear everything in an arrangement. Guitar players, is that true? <laughs> the guys are back there going, no. Guitar no. players, is that true? <laughs> 
Come on, man. That's a little arrogant. And wrong. Man, I, I could go on and on. You know, I'll, I'll make another contribution. It, it, there would wrong. be no rock and roll as we know it if it wasn't for the bass player. Ah. If you want to really Cage think about fight. it. Think about it. No. Would me, Zeppelin have school, happened me, if John Paul George Mike, was playing upright bass? Mike, let me school you. Just saying. Just saying. The guitar. <laughs> the electric guitar. Primarily <laughs> a, a 60s Les Paul through yeah. a, a, a Plexi Marshall. Yep. That's fucking rock and roll. You've but caused it, me to cuss again, but, Mike. But it, now, let me... No, no, no. But no one would have been able to turn up that loud. The timing, everything. Like, if, if you want to know the tempo and timing for the Stones, Keith Richards is not the drummer, yeah. not whatever that bass player's name <laughs> is. The Beatles, guitar players ruled. Well, I'll give you McCartney a little bit, but he was right, a good right, guitar right, player. Right. Every rock band follows the timing of the guitar player because we... we, 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 we perfectly enhance the beat going into the choruses. We rush a little bit, but it's not called rushing. It's called feel for us. Right. And bass players, <laughs> like, like, like in, a, in, a, in a typical song, how many, how many chords do you play on your bass? It, it, you know what? It, it, that, it doesn't come down to that. <laughs> it, what it comes down to is the bass player is the person who's dictating, who's, he's the, obviously the bridge between the rhythm and the harmony and the melody. And I think you, I don't really even have to debate it. All you have to do is look at the track record of the amazing bass players yeah, but, that yeah, but have. All, all you have to do is look at an iPhone. Is there a sub on an iPhone? <laughs> because you don't need it. Right, Herb? Oh, I'm just the referee. There's 10 more <laughs> seconds in the round. No, <laughs> so obviously, we, you know, we, we need it all. We need it all. I, just, I know for myself as a bass player and the musical situations that I was in, the instrument, that instrument enabled me to not have to worry about you know, uh, wh how many pedals I needed to swap and how many this and that and, and what, what the, the chord voice. It was more, I was able to listen to what the guitar was doing, figure out the, what, what patterns the drummer was doing and where the bass needed to lie because where I cut the notes off and where I, how I attacked the notes affected it all subliminally. And I think that that just sort of, you know, helped me, it helped prepare for how I listen to when I'm sitting there behind the board and I'm, and I'm listening to a band player, an artist, give a vocal take, and just making sure that everything is, all the right spectrums are taking up the right space. And, can you know, I, can I ask you both a question? Let me, let me, let me tie this up. This, this is Dave upset, by the way, which is really <laughs> cool. No, no, no. So it's hilarious. Uh, no, in, love, a, in a fun I, way. I love Mike, and he's 100% right. Um, <laughs> let, all my favorite songs, the bass, if you listen to it by itself, is a hook. Yeah. <clears throat> Like, we love Pick Up the Pieces. The bass part's hooky. We love all the songs. And great bass players, <clears throat> of which Mike is one, <laughs> have an ability to create a hook down there that... Right, Brett? Uh, have a hook that, that just, hey, that just grabs you by the throat. And I would argue that, that the, the bass is unique and because it's, it's one of the only instruments in a, in, a, in a modern band that's responsible for groove and harmonic content. And, and that's very difficult to do. All my favorite bands, the bass player and the drummer were like connected. Yeah. And, and that's the most beautiful well, thing question. in the world. So you, the guitar player, bass player, <laughs> you both need a drummer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I, I envy what he does. I'm, 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 I'm being funny. It actually pisses you off. I'm not even being does. funny, <laughs> but anyway, I tried. I, you know, I love you guys, so I tried, but. No, you did good. You did. That but was actually Batter's Box, the angry version. <laughs> there you go. So we'll, we'll cut that up and you'll see but it on the show. But how do you compose a great bass line? Does it come to you from the, from the melody? Does it come to you from the beat? Or does it come to you from the harmonic content, yeah. the chord changes? And, you know, a lot of times it's just it comes from the beat, you know, initially. But, I, I mean, listen, I had the best training ground. You know, Dre's beats on an MPC. Woo. And I'm like, oh, he's like, okay, come up with the bass line. Like, okay, you know, it, it, you know it, it, there's, it, there's just infinite uh, possibilities of notes, rhythm, how you attack it, where you cut it off. And to me, it's just, it's, an, it's a constant, you know, uh, endless search, just finding the perfect bass line. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful that that was the instrument that I chose to just study and listen, you know, and spend all my, my younger hours, you know, learning. It, it, to me, it does affect the entire mix the way the band, the way the singer sings, the way the drummer plays, and uh, in any band, in any track that I write or produce, it's obviously an, a, it, it's an integral part of yeah, the that's, success. That's why I love your stuff. Thank so, you. all kidding aside, thank you. in a couple of seconds, 
We've got mics on either side. Prepare some questions. This is Dep fun having an audience here, actually, cool? by the way. Yeah. And depending it's on your questions, out. we're going to give away some Pro Tools 4 and so on and so forth. So Pro in a couple of seconds, we'll ask you to raise your hand so you'll get a chance. Now, to our, to our esteemed audience, of which if they weren't who they were, we don't have jobs. Right, <laughs> like you're right. I, I mean, I, I'd be doing this no matter what, you know, yeah. to some extent. Yeah, sure. but you know, when people respond and then they use their hard-earned dollars to support and so on and so forth, it allows the thing to move you're forward. Right. As you see it from somebody who I believe, tell me if this is true, you have you have the the ability to be independent and do what you need to do, which gives you sort of the indie spirit, but you understand the mass, the macro sort of inside game. Yep. What if you're an engineer or a producer or a songwriter, whatever the case may be, isn't the first thing to make your craft as good as possible before it comes to you? Isn't that where it starts? Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, you, you want to make sure that it's something, obviously, there's, you know, you, you, um, I'm going through this actually with my daughter. My, one of my daughters, 15 years old, who's mm -hmm. starting to write songs, and, you know, and I have her write down, like, who are your favorite artists and what makes them great? Mm -hmm. And then you've got to figure out, what what you uh, how you want to excel and how what what you're not going to just replicate what they do, how what you're going to do to stand out and make you great. Yeah. Um. And 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 then and you've got to you've got to weigh it as best as you can. Obviously, you don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to make those records, but there's still tools that just make sure that it's hitting, and and that the composition is as strong as it can be, um, before you know you start because it, 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 you know if you if you start if you meet if you have the opportunity to meet someone. And your stuff is just not a you know a, a ten or close to a ten. It's it's going to be hard to even get a, a second shot. And so you just want to try and make the biggest impact right out right out the gate. And and also this is what we preach on the show for these guys. Sometimes the goal isn't just being somebody who does records. Yeah. Like you can take your craft and apply it in other places and have other careers. You You're, support uh, totally. That? It's something that I totally talk. I, I do a lot of workshops and high schools, and I tell them, look, when I first started out, I, my goal was to be in a in a rock band playing bass, and and through a lot of twists and turns, I, I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of great people, and and I and I, I wound up producing, which I had no idea, but when I was 14, 15, what a you know what a producer did, let alone that that would be my career. Um, and I meet a lot of amazingly talented people in the publishing industry uh, and a lot of the different roles at record labels. Like, we need people who have backgrounds in playing music and in yeah. making music in all these different departments because, you know, your voice is what helps shape what, what gets through, what gets past go, you know, and, and we need that. Remember a couple of things. There's nothing that audio is not in. Yeah. Which means that your career opportunities TV, are film, huge. You know. Medicine, forensics, law, health, finance. You'd be amazed at where audio is a part. If you look at it this way, there's no place on the earth that's really silent. Hmm. Especially this place. Think about that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, if you don't do your job, the world doesn't have audio. So you have a lot of power, but you got to sort of think broader than just thinking down the road. And some places, some places... The careers are bigger outside of records. The, the pay is more robust. It comes more directly and so on and so forth. So I'm not telling you not to have your love for music. We all do. Yeah. But know that that powerful tool in audio, you live in a digital media world, none of that happens without audio. None of it happens. You don't post videos that are silent. It's not the, you know, it's not the talkie era or the silent film era. So you got a lot of power. There's a lot of places to go with it. You got two old coots like us that started an online television show about audio. What the hell? <laughs> and now it's, right? We didn't, we didn't yeah, know. We yeah. just, but we just went for it. So Love it. you got a lot of juice, guys. Um, any questions for Mike? Oh, Mike, you have the most robust question <laughs> of the, the question Bring request of the three days, right? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. All right, so because his hat is so dapper, we got to go right up here to warm it up. We'll get back to you. Stay tuned. Hey, hey Mike, I uh, was wondering, was there, could you tell us about a process where you went into a song and it was really a difficult situation and then somehow it turned and became something that you're proud of and kind of unfold that, unpack that, why did it do that and... You know what I'm saying? A song Great that was question. just a hard situation. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes songs Good come question. in. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, where you're listening to it, and it's like, all right, there's parts of it that work yeah. and parts of it that, for whatever reason, aren't, aren't connecting. A lot, the first thing I start with is actually 
uh, the arrangement. And I kind of like, okay, sometimes guys might have what they thought was their bridge is actually their chorus, you know? And so there's been times where I've had to like go, okay, let's, let's, take, let's take this apart, you know? Let's like kind of, unpa you know, throw it all on the table and rearrange it. And obviously, um, you know, having things like Pro Tools and Logic and things like that where you can just sort of like, all right, let's just take this part, part and bring it over here and fly this over there. Um, a lot of times I, I feel that it starts off with the arrangement and making sure that the arrangement and the flow from beginning to end um, is, ex is, is perfect. Um, I, I spend a lot of time making sure that that's right. Um, and then there's been times where, where, you know, the melody or the lyric, that's the, that's the next thing that I go to, is just making sure that the song makes sense and it's trying to get its point across. So a lot of times I'll bring up those questions like, okay, this song, it's really not, you're kind of jumping all over the places or wait, what, you know, tell me what the song meant when you started and try and help maybe bring some focus there. A lot of times I'm not really writing the songs for the bands. I'm, I'm just sort of bringing it up and trying to figure out the best way to have it flow. Um, a, a song I, recent that's doing really well right now on the radio um, they called um, 21 Pilots uh, called Stressed Out. Uh, it was a song when they brought it in, uh, had just certain sections that were in different places. We're like, well, what if we took this here and try that there? And they were open to that. And, 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 it, and I feel like, you know, our, our collaboration and making sure that the pieces are, are what, you know, allowed it to be, uh, you know, improved. So I, it, a lot of it is just sort of dissecting all the p parts of it, whether the chords make sense, whether the, the melody makes sense, and then making sure the form is, is, is right. Nothing goes on too long and there aren't too many lulls. And, you know, it, it, there, there wasn't, I can't say that there was like one song where it was just a, a travesty that I magically waved my wand. More, more often than not, I'll say like, what else you got? You know? Yeah, you know, and, and that's another thing. When I go into making a record, I try and a lot of time, you know, you get certain artists who spend a lot of time making demos. And then a lot of times I'll ask, you know, do you have any voice memos of some things that you didn't finish? And a lot of times there'll be some gems in there that we've turned into, you know, songs that have gone on to do really well or be important parts of the record. All right, big brother in the back with the New York hat, coming to you. <laughs> Make us look good, dude. Very well. Uh, as a songwriter, um, one of the difficulties I've been having lately is working with artists who have a vision for the song and it's different from mine. How do you work with difficult artists? Like if my objective is to do what's best for the song. Yeah. So it's not about really what I think or whatever, but do what's best with us. So how do you work with personalities, that egos, and yeah, well, and and who has been the most difficult to work with? Oh, I won't. That's a TMZ that. question. Can't TMZ. say that. Can't yeah. say that. Had to do I, it. I, I will be honest and say that most of the artists. I wouldn't say anyone's difficult. Everyone just has a different process. Yeah. Um, my, I feel like actually my best uh, talent is being able to read people. Um, I think that that's the thing that's allowed me to jump genres and have all kinds of different people, you know, I mean, the, 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 you know, the personalities of the guys in Mastodon are very different than Carrie Underwood and, and, uh, <laughs> and really? so, you know, you have to learn how to read people, figure out what their talents are. Um, so there might be an artist that I love how she sings and, and maybe isn't the best writer, but, you know, but wants to be a part of the writing process so that it feels like she owns it. So a lot of times you, you have to, you know, you realize that when you're stepping in a room as a collaborator with an artist, and it's, you know, that it's about them. It really is, the, the, they're, at the end of the day, the person that's hopefully going to go up there and sell that music, uh, you know, as a performer. And so they need to feel like they own it and we're a part of it. But not everybody has the best. Some, some artists can come up with tons of melodies and maybe aren't the best lyricist. So it's sort of figuring out what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. And, 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 and making sure that you're encouraging as much of their, their strengths so that even when you, it comes time for you to like go, well, I think we can beat that lyric, that they're not feeling beaten up and like forced to do something that's not them. So I, I think that that's ultimately what I try and do. Management, yeah. management lesson number two, you are all psychologists. So as, trust me when I tell you that when you deal with people, it is real important that you understand yeah. how to connect with them. Yeah. Your ears are sometimes your biggest weapon, which has to do with listening to people, navigating people's emotional responses. You don't know where they are in life, yeah. trying to get the best out of them. You may be bringing a bad day to the table, and you need to edit yourself. There's a lot of stuff that goes on with getting the best performance out of somebody as well as getting the best performance out of yourself. So don't miss that. You can come with all the gear and the great song and be, excuse my French, a dick 
it's not going to work out well for you in the end. <laughs> so keep that in mind, man. Back to your regularly but, scheduled programming. I got, I yes. got a thought on that. Um, show me a happy, content, peaceful person in a wonderful, loving atmosphere, and I'll, tell you, I'll show you a guy with no creativity that ain't going <laughs> to ever create anything. Creativity grows in a soil of conflict, difficulty. Some people call it necessity is the mother invention, but look at, look at Keith and, 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 and Mick. They haven't spoken in years and made some of the greatest records ever. John and Paul, we all know how they had conflict. Happy atmospheres don't produce creativity. Look at Van Gogh. Uh, uh, just on and on and on and on. Expecting a contentment and happiness is, is a killer of creativity. You need to be challenged. You need to have a, 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 the juices flowing. You need some anger. You need some kind of emotion in your life to be creative. And so when you hope for a peaceful environment with everything's love and peace and all that, you're hoping to be not creative. And I'm telling so, you, that's the truth. Yeah. So the good news is, the good news is that if you're miserable, depressed, <laughs> pissed off, angry, yeah. want to whoop somebody's ass, yeah. you're about to make a whole bunch of money. So happy people call Dave, don't call his manager, and go be <laughs> pissed off with him, and you all work all that yeah. out. All right, so what <laughs> sectors have we had? We've had back there, we've had up here. Uh, I promised the tallest cat back there, so... Uh, oh, uh, so you do that. And by the way, everybody back against the wall, if you got a question or whatever, I'm thinking about you all. I see you back there. <laughs> the fire marshals, we consider it sold out when we see the fire marshals. And fortunately for Pensado's Place, for four straight years, three times a week, it's been sold out every time. So yeah. thank you for all that. Yay. Woo! Cool. So we'll get back there if you want something. Question for me. What's happening? My name is Marcus Miller from New York. You talked about some, um, some situations where... Uh, where artists kind of, what, what you saw as challenges that artists kind of face coming to you. I was wondering if you could recount some more uh, success stories that we might be inspired by. Oh. Yeah, um, okay, let me think about this. In terms of like somebody who just came in and- Well, I'll give you one that Mike doesn't like to share. <laughs> Eminem was originally gonna call himself Skittles. <laughs> and, and Mike no, met no. with him, had a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, right? So, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, it, you know, it, I'm trying to think of something specific. There's a, there's a lot of little battles. I that wasn't you, expecting that. That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can pick just one, you know, thing. There's, I, I think every record, there's battles that, you know, little battles, little things that you, you know, that you go through with each artist that you just, you know, you, you really want to just gain their trust. So that when you disagree against, you know, when you have a strong disagreement, that, that they hopefully just so go, go, okay, I trust you, Mike. I disagree, but I trust you. And it, it isn't until the song's completed that they go back and, and say, yeah, I, I get what you were saying. So you have to earn that trust. That's, that's the biggest thing for me. But there's, there's every song, every record, there's always little, very rarely is it like, handed to you on a platter and you just have this walk in the park and everything unfolds perfectly. There's always little choices, little struggles and, and, and little ego things. But I, I try and just make sure that I'm, do, I'm, I'm, I'm a servant to the artists that come into the room and that I, I try and just make sure that they leave with something that they're excited about. Not everyone's going to have the most fun time, but they're hopefully going to be happy with the result. And, and that's what really what's going to keep them coming yeah. back is when they hear the end result and they're excited about it. All right, from the yeah. seated group of people, all right, we, and we need somebody on this side and somebody on this side, and then I got to get somebody in the back. That we, um, all right, somebody seated over here. We got, all right, so, you know what? You right there. So we, oh, no, sorry. That's all right. We'll do both of you. Well, Perfect. we will get questions from both of you. Let's Excellent. I just had a, had a quick question about you, mostly about songwriting and putting together, uh, putting together songs. I noticed that, you know, when I'm working with, like, a lot of electronic music, you get the tendency to want to fill it with so much that you look back later and you're like, where do I put vocals on this? Yeah. Um, you know, and then I try to take some of the stuff out and it just feels kind of dead. Where do you kind of find that happy balance and uh, work on it? I mean, I don't, I'm a little bit older version, uh, so I don't have the collaboration tools online, but uh, um, I was just wondering what goes so through you your head. What do you work on? 
Um, I work on Pro Tools, and uh, so that means you don't have Pro Tools 12. I have Pro Tools 8, and I have also have Fruity Loops. Well, as of today, you have Pro Tools 12. So afterwards, see Chongor, we'll hook really? you up. Really? Absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. Mike Elizondo and Avid brought that to you, so you remember <laughs> that. Live up to it. Go ahead. I, I think you know when I'm starting out a songwriting uh, session, I I try and have I, I try not to put too much on there. I try and have just enough to give the sensation of what like the energy can feel like, and enough harmonic content to start getting ideas flowing. And, but there are, you know, just, just two days ago I was in a session and we were racking our brains, we just couldn't, we had great verses and B verses and bridges and we just couldn't get a chorus going on. And I realized that the music that we were writing to just wasn't feeling inspired. So I was like, you know, give me, why don't, why don't you guys go take a break, ear break, give me like 15, 20 minutes to just see if I can swap some things around and got the energy that I felt was going to be needed to like inspire a chorus. So I, I usually start with less is more just to get the ideas going because once you know what the melody is going to do, then you know what holes you might need to fill in, what type of synth sounds or guitar parts or whatever things need to complement that melody or the attitude or the, the message of the song. It's typically we're, what we're, I'm we're running out of time. Well, you can talk to us after it's done. So yeah. the seated group, there, there you go. Oh, you know what? So wait, who needs Pro Tools 12? <laughs> All right, you, and I'm going to take you, too. So him first. We'll do one here. Short, short question. You can't go for two, man. Yeah. Just, you know. Thanks. How has uh, being involved with the label side of the industry affected your direction as a producer? You know what? It hasn't affected my direction as a producer at all. I think it's just given me an opportunity that once my album is done, that I've produced, that I can actually go and, and, uh, and share the vision of what that artist and what, what, they, were, and what they intend to do as, as a career. Um, with the different departments of the label. So I, it really doesn't affect my production style or choices. It's just now at the end of it, I'm able to go in and, and make sure that the label gets it and is excited about it. So basically it. Hey, Cindy, could you come up for just really quick? I just got to get, yeah. Um, uh, so anybody who got Pro Tools 12, see Chongor, and he will get emails from you. Um, I just duped my makeup artist to think that I needed something. Please give our makeup artist a round of applause. This is the gorgeous Cindy Escalante. You now may go back. Thank you. That was good. She's was been with really us good. for five years. And really what's happening is after each one of these, about 92 guys come up to my team and go, hey, man, you know what? what you know, like, what's her name? And is she single? And she's really good. Look so, Cindy, we're just giving you love because you make us all look so much better. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, a couple things. One is we want to see you come up afterwards and take a flick and take a snap and sign something and thank you for all the support. Two is if anybody wants to go to a show and taping up in the new Pensado Media Center, it's pretty cool. Let us know. We'll give you some of those. Three is Dave and I love you for your support of our show. We love you for the support of our team. It is just absolutely amazing. Uh, we want to tell you that we are going to be bringing absolute heat in 2016. If you think we did okay, I am telling you, you are talking to one crazed Machiavellian black dude who's about to unleash. Would you say that's the truth? I didn't know I was black. Yeah, well, you do. You are. And I'm Spanish. <laughs> he ain't lying. I'm telling you about the Machiavellian. No, no, it's not he, just about me. We just got he, a great team, and he, we care about you a bunch, and we are going to try to keep pushing the bar. We got cool things. So coming. stay tuned. Real cool things. Right? Coming. And then, the, yeah, we have some real cool things. Coming. And then also, please utilize, before we give him a round of applause, the fact that you don't need gear. You need passion. The fact that you have all the tools already in your wheelhouse. The fact that a guy like this can go across the range of artistry and music and genres and absolutely do his thing. The fact that he gave you the keys to talking to major labels and getting your stuff through. That the reality of it is, is that you can't deal with whatever gift God gave you. But if you have the passion for it, you could absolutely turn into an absolute beast of a human being first and a musical talent second. Put your hands together for the incredible Mike Elizondo. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, brother. Thanks, David. We want to thank you. We want to thank the avid people. We want to say hello to you and take a picture and come up front. NAM 2016 is done. We'll see you next year. Thanks, everybody. Hit the music. All right.